Uh, welcome to Ivory Press. I'm, I'm really appreciate that you make the time at 10 o'clock after many, many uh, events that are happening in Madrid uh, these days with ARCO and the gathering momentum that we have in this amazing city. Uh, but uh, I think for all of us, is extremely worthy to make the effort to be here this morning at 10 o'clock to hear Christian McLean and Tomas Araceno, uh, Hansu Bridge and Yuval Edgar uh, to converse, to talk about experimental uh, ways to do uh, art and to uh, convey the process of creation of the, of the artist. Uh, you have all of you the the, 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 the bio of any of them, so I don't want to repeat, only to say that uh, Thomas, uh, uh, we met him many, many years ago in Berlin, where he lives, although he was born in, in Argentina, and since then fly very high with uh, his spiders, his bees, and all kind of flying animals where he, is play, he has developed a, a great new language and understand the vibration of, of all of them and among them. So we were going to talk about his current uh, work and, and, and also uh, we will present his book that just appeared in the MoMA that is here in Ivory Press, out of the library in the MoMA. Um, next to, to Tomas, thank you so much, Hans. Hans Ulrich Ulrich, who is the supreme curator of our times and, and is uh, uh, close to Thomas and uh, he perhaps will talk a bit about the big exhibition that we are going to do in, of Thomas in the gardens uh, where the visitors will be mainly animals from the biodiversity stratosphere. No? And it's a great, great honor to have here Christian Markley. Thank you so much, Christian, for making the effort because we know that for you it's an effort to travel and also to go out from your studio, mainly after the great uh, uh, enlightening exhibition that you have at this moment in the Pompidou. Um, so thank you so much. We, all of us, for sure, have seen and watched some of his work, but I was telling to Christian that we are the last project that we do in our profession. Uh, so he, his last project and his last uh, work, The Doors, who you allow us to see in the Pompidou, is, is the, the turning point to the parangon, to the heaven of your career. And it will be very difficult to go you will, because we all of us thought that after the phone and the clock will be impossible, but the doors is, goes beyond. And Jubal Edgar is uh, the director and research, uh, one of the directors and research, director and researcher of the exhibition of Luxembourg and Co. in London, and also is associate uh, director of one of the most uh, uh, insightful uh, uh, small but uh, full of treasures and the best that we have of the Bauhaus in Tel Aviv. So if any of you any time goes to Tel Aviv, it's the first thing to visit the museum of the Bauhaus where Jubal is uh, handling part of the, uh, the exhibition and the creative. So I leave it, it will be a first a conversation between Christian and Jubal and then uh, Thomas and, and, and Hans, and then they will have a conversation, the four of them. And after, we, we, we really appreciate that uh, you enter in the conversation. You can also stop them to ask or to discuss or to, or to just uh, make a comment about the, the different lines of, or, and thematic that they will tackle uh, this morning. Thank you. You have the... Thank you. The stage. Thank you. Um, 
Good morning, everyone, and thank you again um, for joining, and thank you, Elena, for these wonderful introductions and for the generosity of hosting, thank you, of hosting us here um, in what I agree is a really wonderful occasion and a very opportune moment in both these artists' um, practices and careers. Um, I must say a quick word just to, about the fact that we're sitting in a place that really um, is all of us would agree, is an unparalleled project in the way it addressed one of the most important and problematic questions artists are dealing with, um, not only nowadays, but for a very long century, which is the manifestation of the artist book. Um, but the groundbreaking premise in which Ivory Press addresses um, these objects is an excellent starting point for a conversation. Um, and Christian, um, my conversation with you started a few years back um, based on a very shared enthusiasm to, um, to collage as a practice, but also as a kind of state of mind or an idea or something that really seems to have um, shaped art in, as we know it since the turn of the 20th century. Um, so I'll say a word about this and then pose it over to you. I think that, you know, the idea of uh, making collage in the turning point of the, tw of the early 20th century by people like Picasso and Braque and then the Surrealists was such a complete collapse of everything that was known as a media or a medium in art, uh, painting, sculpture, at that point also to some degree photography. And that breaking of medium into something that happens suddenly behaves in a way that was very, very much frowned upon, forbidden, seen as something that shouldn't be done or is done by amateurs or is done by people who are not uh, our craftspeople or are kind of bricolor, um, really changed the way art is made. But the interesting thing is that the, while collage in the traditional sense of the word maybe has become something we almost look at at points with nostalgia, as a kind of conventional medium, um, the idea of breaking the way we work with medium has become um, the leading point of art in the last century. Um, Christian, you started your career um, in the late 1970s um, in a very strange position, working both or performing both um, as a musician, as an artist, studying art, first in Geneva, then coming to the States, um, performing a lot of music, uh, DJing, uh, and at the same time also making objects. Maybe just a quick question. How did you see yourself when you started or entered into the professional creative world? Did you see yourself as an artist, as a visual artist, as a musician, as a composer? Was that distinction at all important to you? Well, I went to art school and naively thought that making art meant ma painting, you know, painting seemed to be um, what, at, when I was young, I assume art was. But I very quickly discovered, just even applying to an art school, that uh, there's different departments. And I actually applied in sculpture. So since the very beginning, in a way, I, I, I was a confused artist, <laughs> not knowing what direction to go. and having a, a dual nationality allowed me to leave Switzerland and, and try something different in the US. So again, a, a change of environment, um, d different notions about what art could be. I was very interested in minimalism at, at the time and then conceptual art. And so for me, having multiple um, practices or activities um, was something I, I, I took advantage of being a student because when you're a student you can you can experiment you don't have you don't have anybody telling you really what to do and so to me uh, moving to the U.S. was freedom uh, to try different things and I spent a, 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 a semester at Cooper Union studying with Hans Hake and then again here you know strong conceptualism, yet every night I was in clubs um, listening to no wave uh, punk uh, music. And for me, that was natural. These two worlds could cohabit. 
and uh, I think I kept that uh, that openness in a way uh, throughout my career, and uh, I was able to develop a, a career in music that was at the beginning even separate from the art world and slowly they kind of came together there's um i was just looking last night at the um, catalog of the pompidou exhibition and i asked myself so what is the earliest work in this publication and i found your recycled records a series of records you used since um, i think since the late 1970s which you would buy and you would break and then you would glue together either by inverting side A and side B and put them back together or using two separate albums and you'd play them. You'd play them when you'd perform with them, but they also seem to have become objects, artifacts in their own right, kind of coming into the visual field. Um, would you like to say something about this project and how it seems like kind of a, a first sign of Christian Markley materializing this way in which the audible and the visual are no longer... Yeah. I mean, separate. it's a very transitional um, object because it, it, it was foremost uh, at the beginning just an object to use in performance. So it, it had no other value than that. Um, but I was reacting to this notion of, of the record as a, as a document, as a commodity, for music. Music became a commodity through um, recordings, through giving this immaterial um, sound a physical um, nature that could be exchanged. And so I was reacting against that in a way because I loved the idea of, of something live, music that exists for a moment for, a perform for an audience, that relationship to the audience which is the essence of performance. And that um, is really the, the, the trigger in a way that, that made me uh, break these records, uh, but also use them to compose music. So instead of making a record that was a multiple, documenting a performance, this was a one of a kind record. So the, each record was unique. I would cut it with a little saw and, and put these fragments as puzzles back together. And the cuts, the pops of the needle hitting the, the, the cut becomes a, a rhythm. And, and these fragments of music um, uh, are sort of unified uh, in, in this new com combined kind of uh, recording. So this, this uniqueness versus the, the, the multiple of of commercial music was something that I was um, interested in. And, and eventually, so eventually, to, to answer your question, yeah, these objects um, became these one-of-a-kind records and they, they became more precious. Uh, with time, they become more precious because, you know, they become collectibles. But originally, I would show them in a gallery and people could play them on turntables. Uh, now they're inside a vitrine and <laughs> nobody can touch them. It's, it's kind of sad, but that's true of a lot of art. Um, we, we look at it um, as, as artifacts of the past. But for me, these were, at the beginning, really performance objects. You speak of a cut, the cut that you did inside that kind of breaking point that has, and this is exactly where I think in my research into the history of collage, your work popped as this kind of really, really crucial moment of understanding um, where does that term can go, how far we can break things and put them together in fragments, how exciting that can be, not just on paper. Um, the interesting thing is that, to put a bit of context, the late 1970s, early 1980s, there's a lot happening in New York and in the United States particularly um, within the music strand with hip hop, which is kind of adopting or promoting that term sampling, where you take samples from different kinds of music. And in parallel comes this group of artists that we now call the pictures generation artists, um, that includes artists like Sherry Levine and Richard Prince, Louise Lawler, 
um, Barbara Kruger, um, all of which, by the way, would never say they are part of the group. Um, but um, they start doing something else, which starts working around the term appropriation, which differs from the way that collage was understood until that point. And interestingly enough, a lot of people are still writing about them during these years with the term collage in use. But what they do is a bit different. They do a kind of sampling. So Richard Prince or Sherry Levine would take a photograph of an existing photograph um, and then reclaim it, take it away from its original context and bring it to their own context. And you seem to be doing something similar, but you insist on leaving that cut very visible. Your work has these breaks in it that seems to be kind of a thing you keep pointing at or keeping that term. So would you um, say that in that sense, you kind of differ from both what's happening in hip hop and around that group of artists during that time? I mean, the, the cut uh, for me is, is important to show it. Uh, I, I'm not trying to hide it, um, but there's always moments where that cut becomes invisible or there's a link between uh, these, these different parts. Um, I always felt a, a great affinity to uh, the picture generation. And for me, you know, when I first discovered Richard Prince, I thought, well, that's exactly what I'm doing with, with sound. Yet, I mean, that connection between the hip hop world, um, appropriation, uh, sampling, um, historically has, there's very little written about, the, about it, you know. Uh, the, these are two worlds completely separate. And so we go to images, really, and I think there's something about that kind of ephemera of the time, and I'm thinking about your transition suddenly to moving image, um, and I think the first work that you do using the, 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 this, this other kind of material who's, that suddenly became so available, so cheap maybe, and that's film, um, is Telephones that you do in 1995. Right. Um, would you like to say a little bit to describe maybe the project, but also how it was physically done? Okay, yeah, this was um, uh, 1985, I think. Uh, uh, no. 95. 95, sorry. Uh, wrong decade. <laughs> um, and the... the um, Editing video at that time was still complicated, so I had um, access to an avid um, editing suite uh, through a grant. Um, and now, of course, anybody can edit. You know, you could do it on your phone, um, but it was it was more difficult at the time. So the the technology um, has a lot to do with how you know one works. I think. Um, the more available the technology is, the more accessible it is, uh, the more chance you're going to be able to use it. Um, and especially if you're like a young artist with no funds. Um, but that, so the technology plays an, an important role. Um, but the, uh, what, to me, it, it, it's not just about collaging in a way. I mean, telephone is about de deconstructing something. And, and Should I say what the film yeah, is? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can explain it yeah. so, so quickly. It's, it's just a series of jump cuts of phone conversations. So when people um, are on the phone, we're used to in film of having two shots. You know, someone speaking in New York, someone in Paris, and there is just jump cuts from one uh, one space to another. And we accept that as totally normal. Uh, and I thought, okay, what, what if we uh, accept the jump in time as well? So someone, you cut to uh, an old 1950s film to uh, a contemporary film, and we accept that. Uh, so I really played with this simple cut uh, and uh, have this conversation between many films from uh, many different times, uh, and people are having a sort of a virtual conversation. Um, so that that's the the process, and it's it's in a way the simplest 
a video I've, I've done because I'm, I'm really using um, this edit point. So the, the Doors, which is a new video which you haven't seen, uh, maybe some of you, if, if you saw the show at the Pompidou where it's, it's being exhibited until Monday, <laughs> it's closing. Um, people are going through doors. So one actor enters a space but comes out into a new space as a different actor from a different film. In it. So it's, it's this kind of weird labyrinth, uh, this kind of mental architecture. I think of it really as, as a spatial movement by, by these actors and also again from different eras. Uh, and there's this momentum um, that uh, is, is really hard to, um, to create this illusion of continuity uh, as opposed to the, the jump cut of, of uh, a phone conversation where someone says something then you cut to the other. Here you, you're cutting from one film to the next uh, but doors are complicated. Doors are pushed or they're pulled. Uh, the hinge is on the right or the left. Uh, you do it at different speed, running slowly. Um, so you have to find the right um, momentum, uh, the right footage that would flow from one film into the next. And that's the challenge of that piece. So in a way, they're very similar. It's, it's always a cut. Um, yeah, but uh, it, it involves so much more than the cut. I, I guess the floating question, maybe to carry over later on, is whether that difference in process also has an effect on the final product and what that might be. Um, but that would be interesting also to see, I suppose, Thomas, in relation to your practice and how it evolves in these terms, in these technical and material terms. Yeah, Hans. Do you, uh, do you think, because we don't have to interrupt it immediately. <clears throat> we don't have to interrupt it immediately. If you have a last question for Christian, we can do that. Well, I think it, the interesting thing with, for me, with Christian was for, for a while now, is that you've seemed to go on the, the trajectory the opposite way than one would expect. Usually you would imagine, or at least historically, that somebody would start with pieces of paper and ended up in the end with the breaking vinyls and making films and um, interestingly enough I feel like you've had this very immersive back and forth conversation with these media and in recent years and particularly during lockdown so Christian and I had this interview conversation happening during lockdown on the phone which was funny enough primarily about his film telephones um, um, in a very potent moment, but what was so interesting is that you were working on a series of collages that were based on footage Christian would find on the screen, would keep it on the digital screen. He would paste paper elements on top of his screen in his studio, and then he would end up photographing the whole process. And there was this kind of complete clash of so many technologies and such a broad history. And when you see these collages, you kind of you, Richard, it's funny you mentioned Richard Prince. Richard Prince once told me that when he started doing these re-photographies, people said, something's just wrong. I'm just not sure what is wrong with your photograph. And I think there is something about that there. Um, yeah. Well, it was, it was really um, sort of out of desperation, being alone <laughs> in my studio, um, not being able to go out and found material. And I wanted to work on this theme of the scream, because that's how we felt, you know, full of anxiety and kind of frustrated. And I felt like the scream was like the most potent kind of image. And um, I, yeah, I started, you know, I mean, I, from, from my practice of, of, you know, scanning or sampling uh, images, you, you get the, the bende dot, you get the material, the printing material, it gets revealed when it gets blown up. And this, you know, using my screen, which I, I use every day, and, and to, but be, being sort of violent on it by, by really gluing with glue on, onto the, you know, the surface of this screen. So I could use images that I didn't have access to, but I could find online with 
you know, fragments of images that I had in the studio, whatever I had around, because I, I, wouldn't, I couldn't go out and, and search for it. So I found a, you know, this reductive or this, this situation that we were all in, we, we sort of had to reinvent ourselves, you know, having been stuck. Uh, luckily, I had a studio I could go to. And talking later to many artists, uh, we all, many artists found that during this period, it was very productive because we were just with ourselves and um, having to, no distraction and, and really being able to focus. I think that's a really <clears throat> exciting transition because we are now arriving at the extreme present of you know what you've just just done, and that of course uh, leads us to what we're just discussing with Thomas, which is as Elena said, you know the exhibition in London. But I thought we should also go maybe a little bit back uh, to the beginning. But before that, I wanted to thank Elena. Uh, it's amazing to be back here, and I have amazing memories here today, um, actually, of our previous panel here talking with Christian Boltanski and other artists about books. Um, and we want to, in the discussion later on, also see how actually um, both artists present today work in such an exemplary place with books and with experiments with books. And um, I mean, Zaha Hadid always told us there should be no end to experimentation. And I think that's what connects, in a way, uh, Christian and, and, uh, and Thomas. And I will always remember this amazing um, talk about experimentation experience when I grew up in Switzerland, you know, and in the later part of the 80s, um, I came to Zurich uh, to see your exhibition at the, at the Schedhalle. It um, must have been 86 or 87. And you have to imagine what enters a really big space, a kind of an industrial space. And all there was was a floor covered with records. And basically, um, this experience, you know, to work on records <clears throat> was for me a really crucial experience uh, and an amazing experience. And it kind of connects again to books and the very expanded notion of books because it led then to an amazing publication where a box was made um, and basically almost like an artist book, you know, people who visit the exhibition could buy a record in a box and then, as you said, you know, play that damaged record at home. And of course, if you think about, you know, experiments with books, um, that also means, you know, expanded notion of books, a book. Uh, can be so so many things. So that's just a memory which came to my mind. It was actually the same week when I saw your exhibition, there was a concert at the Rote Fabrik in Zurich by the Sugar Cubes with Björk. It's the first time I saw Björk. Uh, and one saw that she kind of, you know, was about to go solo because there was a really bad dynamic with the group, you know. So it was, it was fascinating. Sugar Cube, Christian Markley. It's a great adolescence memory for me from Zurich. And of course, this brings us then also to how it all began with Thomas, because around 2000, um, uh, I started to teach in Venice at, uh, at UF, at the university. Um, and I never really wanted to teach because for me, um, the school I want to teach in doesn't exist. We need to invent it one day because I dream of teaching in a Black Mountain college, you know, where we have art, architecture, science, everything together. And I can't function within these segregated disciplines, you know. Uh, so I did agree, it was the only time ever I agreed to teach for two or three years in Venice, because of a situation where the UF agreed that Stefano Boeri and I combined our seminars of art and architecture. So I was in the Vasari sense, you know, we didn't separate art and architecture, but the students of art and architecture were together in the same space. They, you know, lots of things came out of that experiment. The very first day, you know, as I had never taught, I was kind of a little bit nervous to do my first seminar because it's always difficult when you do a thing for the first time. And uh, I, I kind of arrived in the classroom and this amazing student was there, Thomas Saraceno. And I didn't really have to do anything anymore because Thomas basically ran the class. And, uh, <laughs> and in an amazing way, we all learned from you. And I remember always that two things actually, that you told us about this idea of floating cities. Of, I mean, it anticipates your cloud cities. The idea that we might live future, you know, in the future in flying cities, that kind of another form of, um, of urbanism. We also made a phone call with Gyula Kosice, who was still alive then, he was a pioneering artist um, of the Mada movement, you know, in Argentina, who inspired you for these flying objects. And I also remember that you asked Stefano Boeri and me in the very first class, you just had arrived in Venice, that we needed to organize you a meeting with the mayor of Venice, because the mayor of Venice didn't understand that Venice needed to be a flying city. So I wanted to begin with that and ask you to tell us a little bit about how so early, you know, in your trajectory, a resident student, you had this vision of a floating city 
and the future of urbanism and how to live differently. Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Han. Thank you, Christian. Everybody. It's fantastic to be here. Um, but Venice is floating, right? <laughs> it's floating on water. And this, I think so. We could connect it. And, no, just a few, uh, few thoughts, and I will try to answer that. Uh, uh, and we are floating as a planet Earth, right? Uh, I think so. Norman was a great. Uh, we both maybe admire, but Mr. Fugger, no? He always had this concept of of being floating. Now, there's a, a technical shift. Maybe it was a bit more technocratic to a certain extent, and he always talked about a spaceship Earth, and I think so the concept we are now weaving a little bit in is it come from more, maybe more the mothership Earth, I think so, and a little bit left some some thoughts on on technology not being weaved with uh, society to a certain extent, or try to kind of weave it uh, differently. Um, when 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 you were talking before, I thought a good title of a record will be spinning the grooves uh, because the spider, uh, you know, the orbicular spider, it's spin in in a fashion that I think so. When Hans talk also about walking on record, spider might be uh, walking on um, on records also, right? When and feeling that vibration of the groove, right? And the needles are their legs. These eight plug. Uh, anyway, that was some thoughts. And, and the other one in relationship with flying, also um, with the phone, um, with Hans, we're talking a lot about proverbs. And then there is a beautiful collection of Goya in the back, uh, which is also about the folly of flying, uh, which I thought also connect quite well with the, maybe the tiny introduction about uh, floating or flying uh, and the idea of proverb. This means I'm kind of been obsessed a little bit about proverbs, and I will just read some. Uh, I always remember when I was a kid, Cielo a pecorelle, pioggia catinelle, o nube a corderos, agua calderos. Cuando vean arañas en el suelo, habrá nubes en el cielo. Tormentas en primavera, llena la panera. Lluvias de mañana, o mucho o nada. Golondrinas anticipan primavera muy templada. Si la avispa madruga y velan las moscas, Y están las arañas trabajando, lluvia, ni una gota. Uh, sorry to this in Spanish, I have not them in English. But, but it's a little bit this idea, and again, linking with the phone, I'm thinking how we could read the weather without a phone, just to correct things in a, in a very um, non-orthodox way. Uh, now, how it started with a, with a floating, um, yeah, maybe I have answered already that. Yeah, make it Yula Kosice. You have Ayula. Answered, yeah. Uh, uh, for me, Yula, what was interesting also in relationship what you have said, uh, he was never invited to the School of Architecture. I mean, when we invite him for the first time, I think so. Th his very um, happiness was be present in a world that somehow he always wanted to be. I wanted to escape the world of architecture and enter another world, and he wanted to be part in, in that world. That that was something that somehow we we kind of connected both. Uh, and for me, uh, uh, in relation with Yula was was uh, the ability to describe spaces without uh, the the definition that sometimes architects have. No, like this is a living room, this is a bathroom, this is a, and we'll always add some kind of a dimension that will be uh, different than the way um, sometimes uh, pretty functional definition of spaces we have. Now, before we talk about the serpentine experiment. Yeah which we're working at the moment. But maybe one more question about the past. The future often is invented with fragments from the past. I wanted to ask how it then began with your flying experience, because you went from floating to flying, and of course, you started a whole movement with the aerosene movement. And uh, an important moment in that was, of course, also the collaboration we all had with BTS, mm. um, with the K-pop band, because that created a whole you know, global discussion about it and reached completely different audiences. Mm. And you told BTS in a conversation that you really wanted to lift a person for the first time in the air, not even with solar panels or heliums, that basically we could elevate ourselves and, you know, in a way, be free from fossil fuel. Can you tell us a little bit about this idea? Because it has lots of ramifications. It will also change the future of travel and all yeah. that. Um, yeah. Um, I think so. You're kind of feel a bit guilty about uh, how we move and how we move in the air. 
This mean, uh, yeah, what Hans is referring is this, uh, yeah, long uh, standing research, more than I don't know, 15 years, where we have been trying, uh, together with a few other peoples around the world, uh, to, to being able to, to float with, 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 a, with the sun energy somehow. This means it's very simple. It's, you don't know, but it's kind of a, basically almost like a regular balloon, but instead of having a burner down there, we let the, the sun burn. And with that energy, we are able to, to float uh, in the atmosphere. And this means it's a little bit, instead of flying, it's floating because you then have been drifting with the winds. And, 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 and with, the, with the weather entangled. This means on, on that experiment together with BTS and, 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 and when we launched that project, it was in Salinas Grandes in Jujuy and then together with Leticia Marquez. Uh, after 15 years, I broke my bag. Uh, over 12 years experiment with plastic bags and many construction. This means it's a long standing project. Uh, but we managed to, to make the more sustainable uh, flight in human history. When you compare with the brother Mongol fear, with the brother rights, and, and so forth, and this was done by Leticia together with all of us. Uh, now I have been checking together with MIT just on, on that point. Uh, we have made a, a small program, which is kind of a float predictor based on this idea of moving only with the wind. And if I should go back to Berlin, uh, just move by the wind currents. The best day to go back is the 28th. This mean today is the 21st. 23rd, 23rd, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I need to wait five days. In five days, um, there is a, exactly a, a beautiful jet streams which will, uh, uh, I will take 4.49 days. Uh, this means uh, four days and a half. Uh, with these, I will save 0 0.1 tons of CO2 and 2,240, no, 22,429 liters of kerosene if I would have tried to uh, fly with an aeroplane. This I mean, it's a little bit, yeah, trying to see how uh, practical maybe in one moment uh, have we could uh, move uh, in the atmosphere without releasing uh, so many particles that are so much poison to other people. Needless to say, there are some statistics. Every time you cross the Atlantic for, for good or bad, with an aeroplane, um, um, you diminish the lifespan of somebody else on the planet for two years. I mean, just to carry in our conscience, every time we cross the Atlantic, every time I go to Argentina or, or New York, somebody else will, will live two years shorter. Now, who is the person who will live shorter? Is somebody uh, mostly from the global south, somebody who do not have the access to resources as the global north have, the capacity that I have. But I mean, there is this kind of very strong consciousness of, of how much uh, the, the mobility of, 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 of somebody or the ability to communicate or to be present on the planet can really affect life on others without saying uh, the extinction rates uh, that we are all facing. This has been part of, 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 the, of the work. It really also goes into a little bit that direction, fascinated by how birds move and spider moves and, and a whole uh, other sort. And this brings us actually, as Elena said, you know, to what you're going to do in London, because of course it's an exhibition which isn't going to focus only on the visitors, on human visitors, but it's for the first time an exhibition which is going to focus on many different species who live in the park who are yeah. invited, you know, to visit your show. And you've been for a long time aware, you know, of the influences you have on the world, but also the entanglement you know, of relationships we have with other species. And that's, of course, your amazing, you know, work with, with spiders. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and how in London you completely got, I mean, it's interesting, it's gonna completely change the rules of the game of how an exhibition yeah. works. So first of all, uh, the climate control system will be switched off and uh, the doors will be open. So, you know, the boundaries between inside and outside will be blurred. It will also be the first time ever that there is not just, you know, a piece also in the park, but the park will be the main part in a way. Of the exhibition, um, we, as you know, many of you know, at the certain time have these pavilions every year. It's an architecture commission. This year will be Lina Gottme from Beirut, who's Paris based. Um, and you're going to do many, many, many more pavilions, which are not for humans, but these will be pavilions, as Elena said, you know, will be very much focused on, on animals. Can you tell us a little bit about the vision of this exhibition and how it's going to change the rules of the game? I don't know it will change, but. but uh, yeah, have been uh, and still kind of a, an experiment. This means I just um, watching about uh, 
uh, who might be visiting the exhibition. And within the flora and fauna of the park, uh, we found one bird, which also is uh, most probably is, is being seen less and less, which is a swift. And this swift, it, it, it comes sometimes all the way from South America and all the way from Africa. It comes uh, almost by the time of the opening of the exhibition. I mean, middle of May, we open end of May, uh, and then it leaves by the end of the show. I mean, one of the things is was how we could invite this bird to be part of the exhibition and, and let's say bypass the Brexit rules and all these kind of human-made <laughs> things that we that somehow we compartmentalize the, the geographies. Uh, somehow it seems not uh, in line no, with with the times of of climate change and global warming. This means which visa this bird might need to have or Schengen or wherever it might be. This means this bird will come and then we are uh, trying to change a little bit also the architecture of the serpent. And this means uh, the serpent have a beautiful roof. Is this pavilion, which is in the middle of the park, most of you, you know. And this means we are kind of thinking how we can host that. Um, there are some of the birds who we are working a lot with ornithologists and specialists on birds. We have a heavy discussion with the parks about knowledges of, of how birds might have two couples and still by end of May might be possible that they uh, occupy some of these bird houses that will be installed on top of the serpent also to welcome them and and also there will be solar panels replaying a little bit about our hands and trying to see that all the energy that will be uh, used uh, uh, during the exhibition is uh, generated by the solar panel that we will install hopefully cross my finger uh, because it's a protected building and the law of protection is made very difficult sometimes to change uh, with sometimes the requirement that we are, we are asking. Um, and it's, been, it, it's something which demands a lot about uh, um, wanting to do something, but when that will be possible. This means there will be solar movies. I mean, you will be able to see a movie, but when there is enough sun. And this means we'll drive a lot of patients, you know what I mean, you have to be, um, um, back at waiting for God, you have to go there and then see when things might happen and, and who might be around. And this, who might be around is not necessarily only uh, human visitors, but, um, but all sort of uh, webs of life, which is the title of the exhibition, uh, which might entangle us. Um, and a little bit also with the phone also. We, I mean, I, I got too much FaceTime, you know, after a week you get a report how much time you have spent uh, on front of a screen. And, and this means we are asking uh, voluntarily that half of the exhibition you will not be able to enter if you enter with your phone. In relationship, and this means you hopefully will, will get a little bit another experience also of uh, that uh, highly, sometimes toxic dependency that from, I don't want to say is the majority, but uh, at least for me, sometimes it's good to, to regulate. Um, based be, on lithium and many other. There will be uh, moments sorry. of delinking. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, as part of our talk, you wanted us to make a phone call. Yes. Because in a way, it's actually something a long time before Zoom. We did a lot together when we did the seminar in Venice. It was the kind of rule of the game of the seminar. We would, from every seminar, make a phone call, you know, to people we wanted to talk to and put it on speakerphone. It was a bit of a low-tech version of Zoom, pre-Zoom. And Thomas had this idea to do this today for the first time in a long time. We haven't done this in a while. To dial, it's always a kind of a funny thing because you don't know if the other person is going to answer. So then the phone <laughs> is going to ring. So whom are we yeah. going to call? Uh, <laughs> we call uh, two friends, which are part of the exhibition, which uh, together um, we are, let's see if it works, uh, ringing. He's uh, David Seidling and, and Dennis. There is. Hi, Dennis. Hello, Dennis. Hello. Hi, Dennis. How are you? Hi, hi, hi. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, fantastic. Fanta can you hear us? An applause for Dennis. <laughs> yes. And, and David, are you there also? There. Yes. I, oh, hi. Wonderful. No, we, we were thinking uh, to talk a little bit and introduce part of the, the work that will be present uh, as one of the major uh, works at the Serpentine, which was something a little bit in collaboration with uh, Dennis and David and Pierre Polo, uh, based on the fascination about that I have with uh, spiders. I found out that um, 
um, there was somebody who had been reading many books and very curious, which is David, uh, about spider divination, a very ancient practice that is practiced in Cameroon in, um, in different places. But particularly, uh, David had been studying a lot about spider divination. So, Mia, could you tell us a little bit about that, Dennis? Hey, David. David? Uh, you are muted, I think, so David. Oh, sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay. So, so spider divination is one of several different forms of divination that Mambilla people use, but it is locally regarded as the most serious, the most important, the most reliable. So, an individual might do something else but that's sort of like looking at your horoscope in the newspaper, it's not very serious. If things get serious, you need proper reliable advice. You go and talk to a spider diviner who has a set of car cards, I call them cards, they're leaves, but they have symbols, marks on them, written, uh, cut into them, so you can think of these as being a bit like tarot cards. And these are put over the hole in which um, spiders live, and you ask a question of the spider, and the spider will come out of its hole to see what's going on, it moves the um, leaves around, and you interpret the pattern which has been left with relationship to a stick and a stone that you put near the hole. And you can associate the two halves, the alternatives of your question, with the stick and the stone. Um, and um, you, can, you can have many of these going at once, so you can do testing by asking the same question of different spiders. You can flip the answers, so you, in one spider you say, um, will I pass my exams, choose the stick. In another spider, you say, will I pass my exams, choose the stone. So that they, they're, they're very empirical about this. They do lots of testing. Um, uh, and they kind of make analogies between what the spider does and what the doctors do in the dispensary where they're putting samples under the microscope and saying, well, we've, been look we've looked at your blood sample and now we know you have malaria. Um, That's wonderful. That sort of thing. And, and, and then, then I was very curious with, uh, with a spider diviner practice and I said, David, can I accompany you one day? To, to observe and to see and to meet some of these diviners. And I think so. When we went there, David, 2000, four or five years ago, I think so, right? Yeah. And then when I encountered, a, I mean, it's a village which is very, very remote. It takes you like maybe a solid seven, eight hours. Uh, and I think so. The only white person that they see every year is only David <laughs> in general. And, and when I arrived there, I didn't know really how to approach. Um, 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 I don't know if I take a picture of, of the diviner. I don't know if it was invasive. I, I didn't know if I make a video. I, I feel very uncomfortable uh, within placing in the context today of, of, um, of still related with a certain form of knowledge that seems um, um, certain cultures are t still exploding and, and appropriating. And when, when you talk with a, with a discourse of the restitution of many of these type of practices or how much sometimes object involves certain rituals in relationship with that. I was very careful and I didn't know how to do. Now after one day meeting Bolo, the things came very clear. And Bolo looked at me, this diviner, and said to us, can you do a web page for me? I want to offer the spider divination practice to the rest of the world. And I was very clear path because I was almost as an artist service uh, a dead diviner and the community which I admire and love to develop a web page for them to offer that divination process. Uh, and from there, then we built a web page. We got some funds from the, in, in Germany, from the Berlin First Pile. We did it quite fast. The communication with the village is very remote. It takes a lot of time. When the wind comes, sometimes uh, internet signal function, but, it, but it's very complex. And this means we built it, but we did not yet fully fledge and check 
the whole contextualization of the of the web page with the diviners because it takes a lot of time. And then also the intention is like how the IP also was under my, you know, when you buy the site of the internet, which is namdo.org, was uh, still under my credit card. And then there is a whole transition that the, the moment that we decided to show it at the Serpent and this project, which is their portal, we said we really need to clarify the terms and condition, how in the long term, let's say in 100 years, this, this project will continue. And with that, I think so, I want to introduce a little bit, Dennis, that but I think so over maybe a year, year and a half, we have been doing this transition of how really this web page can be managed by them, how they could enter to the internet, how they can upload new images, how to do a workshop for them to really be completely independent that this web page is something which is fully from them. And Dennis, could you tell us a bit the workshop that you have been doing there and, and, and what was the result and explain a bit who you are and how you have been, been working a little bit. Dennis, ah, you are muted again. Can you hear me? Yeah, now perfect, Dennis. Thank you. One All right. Yes. Yeah, so my name is Dennis Indalor. I um, I am a primatologist by training, um, and I happen to be doing some work uh, in Somia. We are the invitation of the chief to look at conservation and livelihood issues. And that is when I first learned from David uh, and eventually from Thomas about spider divination. But also when I got, when we got to the village, we were curious as well. And we now got to learn about this in a very important traditional practice. And the work that we have been doing there is to safeguard um, chimpanzees. There's a population of chimpanzees and other wildlife whose as, um, you know, status is, is, is very grim, given the um, uh, issues with deforestation and, and, and bushfires and things like that. But what, what we've been trying to do, and what is very fascinating in the transition that Thomas talked about, is um, starting our story by talking about spiders really gets us to open doors because of the way that the practice and this cultural uh, uh, practice is, is, is more almost divine in the village. And a few months ago when I was there uh, and in consultation with Thomas and David, we decided to, to get my organization, CBBM, involved in the transition of the program. And to affect that, I had several meetings, not only with the chief of the village, but with Bolo, the diviner, and another person, uh, Irene, who is involved in the program, to chat a way forward. The first thing was to show them what Thomas has done at their request, uh, get the approval of the content of the website, uh, get the approval on David, uh, uh, Thomas's and David's intention to move the program to camera so that it can be run by our organization who have staff who are on the ground and also got their feedback on how that will work. And through all of these complex discussions and, and relationships that we're creating, we came up with a community protocol on how the Engandro project could continue to be shown to people around the world and people around the world can practice uh, uh, this uh, um, a divinity program, and at the same time, how the resources that are raised from those this these practices or consultations by outsiders can be used to foster conservation uh, of wildlife, foster the protection of forests, help with uh, the protection of the water catchment and, and other development activities in in the community. Thank Another you. important aspect of this that the diviner has asked for, and we actually started implementing was to bring in Gandu, this, the, the, pra the cultural practice of spider divination to the young people, to the people in the classrooms, and, and, and teach them, and remind them as they to grow up that That's this great, is a big part that, of who they are. That brings us and full circle. we had a workshop with a, a spider art contest uh, <laughs> in one of the schools, and they were, they were about uh, 100 children. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank I'm you so much. Big round of applause. <laughs>
applause and we sorry can you hear me thank you david thank you Dennis. thank you Dennis. thank you Dennis. i can i can hear you thank you thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, and I think we thought that we could now, in the second part yeah. of the panel, before we open it up for your questions and comments, maybe talk about the books, no? Because Christian has done an amazing book. Thomas has done an amazing book. Shall we do that? Yeah. I think maybe there was, there was something very nice happening here right now with technology. And I think maybe that's a nice point to start talking about your books and about books in general, artist books and their connection. Books are, as much as we don't think of them today but so much like this, they are a technology. And they are a technology that seems to be kind of um, um, constantly looking on places and where to evolve. And, um, and I think both of your books and your engagement with books and but this is why we're here today, because we're sitting in a place where the, really there is a, a huge engagement with how to work on books by artists, how to break limitations, how to make an artist practice behave in a book. And I think both of your practices also kind of seem to break a border between this kind of discipline of what senses can be used in what things. That a book is for the eyes and is not to be smelled or touched in the same way and that a book has to be, obviously books have behaved very differently throughout history. Um, I think maybe, I don't know, Hans Ulrich, would you like to start by talking about the book project, uh, the MoMA book project? Yeah, I was wondering where we should start because <laughs> uh, Christian has been doing books for such a long time, so maybe we could Go there yeah. first. And yeah. I could ask yeah. Christian a question, then maybe you ask Thomas a question, so it becomes a bit of a Absolutely. crossover. No? So I was very curious because when I had this incredible experience, knowing the 80s as a student in your show, um, the record became a book in a way because you made a box, it became a multiple. Uh, can you tell us a little because, of course, we know your index and the extraordinary uh, compositions, you know, which are, which are here, which are recent artist books. But obviously, kind of in the 70s, when you began the war, was an incredible tradition in the 60s and 70s of the generation of, I mean, we spoke about Boltanski earlier, who was here, but also the Fluxus generation you know, has done an amazing kind of number of artist books. Scarves became books. I mean, think about George Brecht and Edison Knowles and all of these artists. Um, can you tell us a little bit how that was of an influence and where, when you did your very first artist books? Um, yeah, Fluxus is very central to my education. Uh, I discovered Fluxus in, in Geneva through John Armletter and the group Eckart. And um, I, um, I always think of, of you know, uh, uh, though you think of it as a book, it, it's a record. And I was trying to make a record that was not a traditional record in a way. Um, so I have to explain that the record that was in that box uh, came out after the show was over. So the records that people had stepped on, the records that were damaged by footsteps, were then packaged and sold. And only then could one discover the recording in that, in that groove, so only one side. Um, maybe some spiders had discovered before, but... <laughs> Um, that, that moment was really interesting because the exhibition existed and then this object has been transformed by the visitors um, and became um, a, 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 a kind of a leftover of the exhibition and was finally, you could listen to it. And the recording on it is the recording of footsteps I recorded my own footstep in my studio. So that clicking, that rhythm of walking, then uh, was mixed accidentally by the scratches on the surface of the record. So there was this homogenous kind of sound rhythm, uh, accidental from the scratches and the recording. So for me, it, it, making a book is always it's not so much a, a documentation, 
but it's more um, an extension of an exhibition. Uh, I love making books because I know that that's what's going to remain is, is the book. The exhibition is, is very temporary. And I think the book shouldn't be necessarily there to um, emulate the, the exhibition. It, it's there to uh, possibly show the work in a different light, you know, through text and, and, and image. It's very different from a record. I mean, the, you know, the, a traditional record um, is there and is sort of a substitute for music. Uh, it's it's not the same as the live music or even the recording. You know, it, it's it's a degraded kind of uh, leftover. But the book offers a possibility to make something unique and 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 different. Uh, and of course, in the process, it documents uh, the exhibition and and the work of the artist. But it has to be more than that, um, more than a document. And that actually connects to what both of you <coughs> so brilliantly discussed before when uh, you talked about these early pieces with the records mm -hmm. and you said that before they were in vitrines, you know, they were actually sort of performative objects. Um, and our first encounter has to do with that because when in, we met in the 90s, you know, I invited you to contribute to the Do It Project, which is a show um, which began exactly 30 years ago where we invite artists, it's still ongoing, mm -hmm to do instruction pieces. It's very influenced, of course, by Fluxus. And I remember, you know, when I met Alison Knowles for the first time, she told me that she and George Brecht and the whole, and Yoko Ono, of course, also, who worked a lot with the whole book, you know, with instructions, the Grateful Book, that for them, the book was kind of a performative object. And you made the whole Dewey book. I mean, you're, in, in many ways, your piece, in every Dewey book, was always the most radical piece because you made the whole Dewey book into performative object. Can you tell us about that piece? Yeah, so it, I mean, it, it is a, a piece for a book and it, it can only exist because the book is sort of a sacred object, like a record, you know, we used to handle the records by the edge and make sure they didn't get scratched and didn't get any dust. But my, my contribution to your book was um, uh, an, an instruction to, to tear the, the page out of the book and, and, and then to crumble it uh, and, and while doing this, listening to it. So it, it's a very destructive act and it's very fluxus in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, um, but, but it, it is the tension that exists between the sacred book and what I instruct people to do um, is, is what you know, makes what is, is the strength of the piece, I think. Um, and, and especially now, uh, books are, in a way, even more sacred uh, in some ways, um, I think. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, ana they're analog. Um, they're made with very sophisticated technology now, printing and everything, but they're still wonderful tactile objects um, that, um, we interact with, and, and uh, I, I love that aspect of, of the book. And that's so important, and of course, what Elena has created here with Ivory Press and with this space here is a celebration of this, you know, tactility of the book. But I think you, well, you wanted to talk about these amazing two books of Christian, which yeah. are more recent. What are compositions yeah. and the compositions and the compositions yeah. and index, and I think I had this thought coming here about um, the way that and there was a there was a very famous analytical philosopher of language who, in very simple terms, basically said, you know, the biggest problem we have with art versus or art as we call it, pictures, images, sculptures, versus script, versus text, versus um, scores of music, is that ones have a kind of what he called notational system. You know how to replicate them. There isn't a forgery of this book. There is a replica of this book, but if you make Vermeer's painting again, you're forgering. And I think there's something about Christian, your approach to these books, which kind of makes a mess out of that distinction, because you work with scores very often or with kind of patterns that enable scores. And I mean, the index book really 
if anybody can see, is composed of a lot of the materials where Christian uses found images, but also found, for example, texts from manga or comics that behaves like onomatopoeias, where language is actually spoken or made to a nonsensical sound and using these as a kind of a score. But to what extent does that mean that your compositions have infinite interpretation? Um, to what extent, because these things are often being performed thereafter, and I wonder to what extent do you feel that you have ownership over the score and how it's performed? Well, the, the score is, is different because it's, yeah, it can be in a, in a book form. I mean, here are, um, it, they're not really scores. Yeah. I mean, the index is, is really a book about, um, about the process of um, the way I work, um, finding images, cutting them, transforming them, Xeroxing them. Uh, it's, it's this kind of quick, fast intervention using the copy machine uh, or the scanner. Uh, and I realized that over the years I had accumulated all this material that uh, is not finished work. It, it's really the process, so it's like a sketch in a way. Um, but I don't really draw. Um, I, I, I work with found material. So uh, that book is, was a way to kind of show that aspect of the work. Uh, the, the, this, this book is, um, what I like about this, this book is that it, it's very fragmentary. You can never, it's, it's sewn, each image is the size of, of the double spread. Um, and it's always interrupted by another fo uh, folio. So the folios are in one another. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking down my own work or cutting it up in, in a way. Um, so I think I'm always questioning the format of, of how, how we uh, interact with, with a book. Um, and so nobody, uh, you know, most, you know, there's page one and two and three, um, but nobody really looks necessarily at books like that. You know, we kind of flip through them. And, and I love that aspect of, of books where um, you never know what is going to pop, uh, what you're going to stop your index on and, and, and look at it. Um, so thinking, and, and also I, I'd like to point out that um, the making of a, of a book is a collaborative effort with graphic designers, with printers, and I love that dynamic. Um, and um, that's why I enjoy making books. It's, uh, it, it's, it's always sort of a, a group effort. Um, the material comes from me, but then it gets developed through conversations with uh, graphic designers and, and printers. Yeah. And this passion you know, for book is something, Thomas, which is essential also in, in your work. And before we talk about, because you were suggested, you know, why this, we should talk, I think, about the MoMA book here. Yeah especially, and uh, uh, Elena uh, also, you know, of course, told us a lot about this amazing, amazing book. Uh, Francis Reynolds is here, who is, was also involved with this, uh, with this project. But before that, maybe to make a link, not to what Christian said about Fluxus and about Do It and DIY, you also wrote instruction pieces here. There is a spider instruction piece. I thought you, maybe if you would read it. <laughs> Inside the home we share, uh, inside the homes you share, listen to the spider playing its web at night. Switch off the headlights and let other shines above you. Bathe in lunar, in lunar cycles. Take off with these planets. Tomorrow is another turn around the sun. Now together, enjoy the ride. And in terms of this, you know, performative aspect of books, uh, which Christian, you know, emphasized, uh, we are working at the moment actually for London in collaboration with Ivory Press on a, on a book which will be exactly that. It will mm -hmm. uh, sort of mirror this performative aspect also mm -hmm. of the show. And Chris Bailey is here, the Southern Bank Curator, of course, the Ivory Press team. And we had an amazing meeting yesterday. Can you tell us a little bit about that becoming book, which will be... Uh, and of course, that connects also to um, your idea also of making um, 
you know, carbon neutral books. Mm. The book for the mm. shed. That's mm. a more recent artist book mm. also. So maybe we could begin that. Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, yeah, a little bit like thinking about what what the exhibition is for and made with. Um, we are trying to think a little bit about uh, the different umbels that each uh, visitors of the exhibition is coming and how to make an um a, a book that also could be enjoy or or that the spider could say I love to make books uh, and this mean um, you know um, it, it's well known for example that dogs they're very bad to see red right and this mean if you will print a page with a with a tonality of reds, the dog will not be able to see what you have printed in the book. And it's been one of the idea was also, okay, maybe it was, uh, to make the book, uh, the, the dog participate, because many people uh, walk around with dogs uh, and a serpent, and remember the doors are open. And maybe we can hang some of these pages uh, at the serpentine, and then the, the pages which are more looked by the dogs will be the one that we are selected for the publication, right? Because, but they will have also a type of coloration that you might be able, or the one that are leaked or not in relation with that. This means also how it is printed or how the smell is, because also um, they have a different olfact. The cats also see in black and white. And this means there is a lot of uh, idea of how to do the book in relationship with this multi-species encounter that we are trying to produce at the Serpentine. That's uh, a little bit some of the threads that we hopefully will be weaving with so the book. That's a future book. And I think you really wanted to talk about the MoMA book. No, and I now have to put you on have to gloves. Put the gloves on. Yeah, because yeah. we need gloves for that book. Maybe that would be great because it's a very, very fragile book. Yeah, yeah. it is like a performance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, I wonder in a project like this. So first of all, probably Thomas, maybe you want to tell us a bit about the process of making this book. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, was nice what Christian said, because also, as, as you mentioned, the process of collaboration, that we are trying to collaborate with uh, non-humans into the making of the book. But in this specific, I want to mention Chisato also, which was very crucial. Uh, he's a, he's a pop-up book artist that uh, we have uh, made this book uh, um, yeah, together. And she was very crucial because she had a lot of knowledge and techniques of, of how to do it. And then playing with uh, with existing things from book. No? Usually you have this bookmark, no? which is, I don't know if this book have it, but you, you have these threads that are weave something in the book to, to mark the page. And then I said, okay, what, are, what about if you take one of these and this becomes like kind of one of these threads of the spider and the spider that start to crawl into the book and weave the, the different lines. But um, yeah, it's very beautiful how it's installed here because the light also how it sits and then project the shadows into the rest of the pages, I think. So it's a So in a project a, like uh, this, how much you were talking about, and I found this to be something that's very also, by the way, kind of really runs through both of your practices and your approaches to books. How much is accidental? How much is not planned? Because, you know, the Christian, you spoke about the intervention of the, the graphic designer, the idea that you clash your own images and you kind of, I think, find yourself also surprised by how you open them sometimes. Um, and then I look at a book like this, which seems to such an extent a pristine and careful labored process and is also a very small edition, as you explained. Um, how much is accidental? How much emerges in the process and not in the kind of planning in advance? A lot, I would say. Uh, it's a lot of uh, trial and error. Many, many of the things uh, were not really working. Uh, and this meaning is uh, keep trying, persistent. I think so. It's like how long you will keep trying until the accidental kind of emerge from 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 the process of making. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's keeping also the dialogue, you know, with uh, with the different uh, uh, people that uh, are involved into the process of making the book. Yeah. And for Christian. Um, Shouts is, is always really important. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's sort of an order that you create, but 
um, it's it's there to be to be broken and to be changed, um, you know. Um, but it's not always possible. You can't make every book um, a challenge to the reader. But it's nice when 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 it's not the obvious, you know. When a book, you know, it it happens with so many books. Even like a cheap um, paperback, you know, am I going to break the spine or not? Uh, and at what point do you kind of let go with it? Um, and uh, I find that, you know, the, the reading um, or the looking um, should be considered. I think it's, it's just because it, it is a medium. Uh, it has its own conventions, uh, but I think that it, it needs to be questioned all the, all the time. You have to question those conventions uh, in order to make something interesting and challenging and, and uh, to make it uh, a different experience to the reader. Thank you so much. I think we should soon open it up. I had one last question I wanted to ask you both, which is, you know, my favorite question, as many of you know, is the question about the unrealized project. Now, we know a lot about architects and realized projects because they publish them through competitions, but we know nothing usually about artists and realized projects. But today, in the context of Ivory Press, I thought we should not just in general talk about your unrealized project, but about unrealized book projects. And it's interesting because, you know, in a way, I always remember my conversations with James Lee Byers, and he, you know, he actually had this amazing object he wanted to do, which he called a perfect object. It would have been a book entirely made in gold, you know, a golden cube of some sort. And he famously, when he wanted to do it as a, as a catalog for a museum exhibition, and the director of the museum <laughs> explained to him that it's too expensive to produce, he locked the museum director into his office, into her office. And, um, you know, so, so obsessed he was by this book. So I was kind of wondering if both of you have an unrealized Book, because I always had this dream, you know, I have an unrealized book project. I wanted to once, I always want to make a book of all the conversations I've ever made with artists, and they're quite a lot, on very thin paper like layout, you know. So it would be a very, so that's my unrealized book. I was kind of wondering if you have an unrealized book project, a book which hasn't happened yet. Well, all, archive. All, all the books that uh, I'll make in the future, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they are yet. <laughs> um, uh, they're unrealized. Um, I don't, I can't, I'm always thinking of, of uh, possible projects, um, but I think because, because the, the making of a book is, is, is so much about what you want to put in it, the material that you want to put in it, that sort of dictates what, what the form in the end is going to be, you know. Um, so, yeah, I have I have an idea right now for a form a a, a magazine uh, because and I can't really talk about it because I hate talking to about, about projects that don't exist uh, because I I feel like the magazine is actually the form that's most appropriate for the project I want to do so it I think that um, that's the the raison d'être of, of um, a book is, you know, what is the best form for that project? And uh, I mean, the, I think this, this book is beautiful in a way because it's all about fragility and there's nothing more fragile than the spider web. And, and that, um, you know, delicate and, and uh, fragile and um, works, uh, works for the project. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah. I don't know if you have a book that you want to realize, maybe, but I, I love the, maybe we should <laughs> make this record uh, for spiders yeah. only. That's a collaborative <laughs> thing. That's amazing, yeah. That but instead fantastic. of walking, they'll have to slide down. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, yeah. But because, I mean, when, when you apply also the sound of the breaking, no? because it's so important, it seems, this uh, um, breaking the boundaries of the, sometimes the visual and the audible, no? that um, um, 
when you're really entering the senses of others, you know, a, a spider produces vibration which go beyond, uh, below the, the 20 hertz, which is the threshold that human hear. Sometimes that's six hertz, a very, very low, tiny vibration. And, and this means what, uh, what it might be, the, the tiny crack of the breaking of a page that, uh, that we will never hear, but, but, but spider, yes, right? Uh, during the pandemic, the, I mean, they're living on this on this string. I mean, yeah. So it is a string instrument. Their their web is vibrating all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when they communicate one to each other and send these uh, vibrations, when there is no wind, uh, they can filter exactly which uh, kind of noise uh, come from the vibration of the web through the wind or through the rain, and the other one, which are very punctual vibration, which goes even beyond the. the the human hearing, um, and uh, no, I just want to come back because the book that we are planning, uh, actually, yesterday we started to brainstorm about uh, the billions of ideas, and then, uh, as you say, Christian, then it come very concrete, and, and I think so. Yesterday was quite useful of the practicality of saying, well, that then uh, how an unrealized project, which maybe will be always in my mind, it kind of become concrete through collaboration. <laughs> there are six authors, there is an audience, there is a reader, there is a, a visual component, and I think so that's also a, a part that um, how this dream become kind of a reality also, which is interesting in the process of making. And I would say there's something about this, this exactly maybe brings us back to Ivory Press. There is something about the way that the books behave here that doesn't listen to what we were told books are meant to do. Mm. And... Uh, and I was left with that one essay I kept telling you about from your recent Pompidou publication that's called The Eye That Looks at the Hand That Holds the Ear. And it's based on a photograph of Christian, well, Christian's partner holding a sculpture of an ear, of Christian's ear, his bad ear. Um, but maybe that melting of limits is also a good time for us to open the stage for questions. And if anybody wants to make a comment or a question, First of all, uh, good morning, and thank you, Elena and Ivory Press, for creating this intimate setting to uh, meet uh, this level of uh, artist. Um, I want to go back to the comment that Han said about the Black Mountain College, which is a school that I think fascinating and linked directly, I think, to Bauhaus, um, and to the experimental way of working and thinking of both of you, Christian and uh, Thomas. And uh, maybe it's to hear your thoughts, not necessarily a question, um, I'm always kind of asking myself how many engineering dean schools come into this type of talk and basically how we can make this approach of artists an experimental way of thinking and question leading approach more common on the disciplines at least that I'm interested in technology and engineering. And I think uh, Hans, few years back, you did a conversation between Ivan Spiegel and Alex Israel about the collaboration between a tech company and an artist just to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think in a way we, we need not only this um, new, you know, Black Mountain College, which I still believe is missing, but I also think that we need new experiments in art and technology because there was this other initiative, you know, in the, in the 1960s by, by Billy Kluber, whom I met and, and interviewed. Um, and the late Billy Kluber, you know, worked with Lilian Schwarz and, and Rauschenberg and many others. Um, and I went to see actually Lilian Schwarz the other day, she's almost a hundred now, you know, and she was telling me they worked very closely with Bell Laboratories, you know, and the artists really had residences there. I mean, Lilian Schwarz went to an office there, had basically a studio in Bell Laboratories and would hang out with the Nobel Prize winning scientists and, and engineers, as you say, you know, on a, on a kind of a daily basis. So I think we need also that type of thing. We need to sort of think again how we can connect artists and engineers through that. And then, as you mentioned, engineer, I mean, the Billy Kluver initiative was a great example. So we need, you know, new alliances with, with what are the Bell Laboratories of our day. I mean, Bell Laboratories was the leading tech company of, of that time, somehow. Um, yeah. No, I've been uh, quite involved with, uh, between art and technology. I come from a background uh, inherited by my family. And, uh, and I was very happy today that the Spider Diviner was here. 
has uh, not, we'll say, is an antithesis of technology, but yes, that's something which somehow lately um, have been more and more present into my mind and how uh, um, have been weaved through uh, that, um, that thread. This been through with a group of arachnophilia. Uh, I participate about some conference about, um, this is a prize, about $1 million that are given to the first um, community who is able to talk with uh, a non-human species. Right, and and with the and because we have been, um, you know, leading research in science also, based on spider communication. Right, we have a big archive of uh, something which is called biotremology, um, and, and then you know, have a, a PhD student from Max Planck Institute based on uh, group animal behavior from MIT, and they all came to study um, and uh, even the technology we have developed for uh, record these very tiny vibration. Uh, in that context, I was very happy that now they, they a little bit, they, the way how MIT is steering also uh, have been led by the spider diviners in Cameroon also. This means I have collected a lot of questions which will be part of the exhibition also at the Serpentine. And this means I asked MIT, you know, fundamental questions of how uh, their research should be given. And the diviners with the spiders have applied to that in a kind of very tiny concept, but just a little bit of statistics, 5% of the population of the world still hold a certain knowledge, which we call it traditional ecological knowledge, tech, uh, which they maintain and preserve, which is indigenous community around the world, that you could classify as spider divine, and also in this community, and are the one who preserve and maintain 80% of the biodiversity of the entire planet. Now, these people are alive. They have a quiet knowledge, like the proverbs I've been reading, and somehow we don't talk so much about that extinction and the weaving of, I think so, between very high technology and still a knowledge which, uh, you know, spider diviners uh, somehow, as, as David was saying, are used also as, um, as a rule of court. This means if a spider replies seven times you are guilty of a crime, you go to jail. While sometimes the process in other places where we suffer a lot about arachnophobias, uh, um, they are not weaving that relationship that sometimes is still alive, that, that type of knowledge. Can I tell you that in this moment there are several institutions that they are not exactly the Black Mountain because it's irrepeatable, uh, but uh, there are institutions like uh, MIT Lab where artists, biologists, engineers, architects are working together and designers, designers of clothes, uh, designers for clothes to go to the space, um, that they are putting together exactly a very uh, high-tech and at the same time very lyric and poetic approach to understand our planet, our behavior, and the future. I can put also another institution, the Butler School in, uh, in, in London, the Department of Architecture. They have a department uh, with biologists devoted only to explore the animals and the materials to make this world more, uh, more livable. And behind you, behind this panel, you have 10 scholars coming from uh, India, uh, from London, from China, from who are here uh, precisely at the Norman Foster Foundation as uh, for a workshop uh, focused in energy. And from there, and with another institutions, we are trying to put together that students and scholars for the future and leaders of cities understand also the work of art and the work of engineering and the work of tech. In fact, the Spanish artist Cristina Iglesias was part of the uh, last, uh, last workshop devoted to sustainability. When we had biologists, we have engineers, we have architectures, we have you and Patterson, who is the first artist that is going to do a big project in the, in the whole uh, park of Apple, the only artist woman who is going to work with the stars uh, after the pop-up that Olaf would. So your wish, Hans, um, is step by step being working out by different institutions which are associated with high tech, but at the same time are integrating dance. In fact, in one of the 
a office of, uh, of MIT Live. They are a great piano. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, you can listen to a concert. Meanwhile, the uh, violists, uh, the biologists, and the architects and engineers are researching. So they are a great uh, 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 bridges and wider and wider that put together all the, uh, all the disciplines. Well, I think that's a super important point, Elena. And I think, you know, what, uh, uh, what your foundation does is, is, is incredibly important in bringing that together. And as you say, also in architecture, uh, there, it does exist. But I obviously come from, you know, coming from the art world, my point was mainly about the miss. Yeah, exactly. But it's, there is still something missing. And what is missing is an art school, which is like the Black Mountain College. Because I went to see Simon Weil, I went to see you know, several artists who have actually studied at the Black Mountain College. And that type of education, they experience, doesn't exist right now. But it came from, a, it exists more in architecture, as you, you gave the example yeah. also of Baden. It exists more yeah, in places like uh, MIT. Uh, it will be ideal, a, a, school of uh, of, a school of art where we have the a yeah. cage of our time, yeah. the Merced Cunigans of our time, the Alberts of our exactly. time, That's missing. the Bucky, Bucky yeah. Fuller of our time, all together to 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 convey the knowledge to the future. No? That's the, the dream, no? Yeah. We will do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Take, takes time. <laughs> takes time. Hi. Christian, I wanted to ask you to tell us the story that links telephone and Apple and the iPhone. The anecdote. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's so interesting, but um, I mean, the, the the link between art and technology. Um, well, uh, my first experience was a bad experience where um, Apple contacted me and wanted to use my video telephones to advertise a new iPhone. This was like in the nineties. Which, for which I said no. I didn't want to be reduced to an ad. But, um, but I have collaborated more recently um, with Snapchat. Uh, you mentioned th this interview uh, you did. But, um, and even though I'm not a, a social media user, I don't, I don't use uh, my phone for that at all. I, I have no presence on social media. I was still fascinated by the access of, of companies like Snapchat um, and you know billions of users um, daily uh, communicating through short videos and to me that was fascinating and so I, I agreed to collaborate with them and it's interesting yeah there, there is a, a, a huge gap between artists and, and technicians, um, engineers, uh, you know, people working with algorithms and uh, technologies that I'm not familiar with. And to me, that was eye-opening and wonderful to collaborate with uh, such smart young people um, looking at the world from such a different point of view. Um, but it, it, unlike a school, it, it's not about uh, working together towards um, something more utopic. It's, it's really, you know, I, with, with some of these companies, they, they want results, you know. They want more users, and, and they use the artists to, to create that. So it's, it's a balance between, you know, being used um, and, and benefiting from this new technology. So. The, even though the dynamic is maybe not uh, right, uh, it, it still opens up an incredible amount of, of possibilities. And can you describe how that Snapchat project exactly worked? How you used the Snapchat? Well, I, I've, I did two projects with them. Uh, once I, I was approached uh, for this uh, uh, can Creative uh, Week, uh, where, where uh, the new technologies are being demonstrated. And, and it's more about these companies trying to impress each other with, with uh, doing projects. And, and um, Snapchat approached me to, to do a project then, which eventually, 
developed in, into um, uh, an exhibition at, at LACMA. But what I did was to use uh, these, these videos that people make and uh, make publicly available because you have a choice to make your, your little 10, or, uh, 10 second videos uh, public or not. And I had access to the public ones and to create a, a musical composition with these fragments. Because I, I noticed that um, a lot of people use the camera, uh, but they don't really think about the sound. Not always. I mean, in some cases, when they take a, a little video of their howling cats uh, or, or, or dog or, um, um, or something that doesn't make a sound, uh, I use these little videos as found material. And like I, I edit my, my, my own videos, I, I worked with this raw material. Uh, that, that was the premise of it. Now at the exhibition in Paris, uh, there's uh, something um, that uses their augmented reality. Uh, so with your iPhone, you can scan the uh, facade of the Pompidou and uh, by touching, I, I've divided the facade of the Pompidou into these, these vertical keys, and you can actually play sounds that I've recorded within the museum uh, of just noise, concrete sounds, like a squeaky door or a rhythmic uh, ele um, elevator or, or um, sounds that uh, I made in the building. So it's really uh, about the, the architecture uh, uh, making sounds and and you can create these little compositions and send them to your friends so it was you know something um, that I didn't think was possible to make and uh, you know through this collaboration with the engineers I could develop something like that and you know it was fun and light um, but I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, you know, to use technology, uh, the technologies of today. The old phone uh, dial-up, you know, attached to the receiver attached with a cord uh, is an ancient tool. Um, and now we all have these devices and they, they're so important to, to our lives, yet um, very few people make art with them. I showed the videos on the, uh, on, on the phones themselves, and the sound was heard through the phone. So uh, it's it's an object to um, create the work, but also as a playback unit, um, you can you can experience it through the phone. So thank you very much to the panel, Thomas, Hans, uh, Christian, and Yuval for being here this morning. We have been here sitting two hours listening to you. And we will leave with a lot of ideas and I'm sure learning. And I will invite uh, anybody who is here who wants to visit the books uh, that Ivory Press so it will be great. And, um, and after we have many things to do in Madrid and we all of us, we are going to go to another place now. And uh, it will be here, Ivory Press team to lead you through the whole, the whole space. And uh, I think uh, our four particip participants needs a very, very, very strong 